Well, this has been a really interesting journey adapting this book because of course the book not only is so beloved by so many and for good reason, um, you know, it's it continues to be such a cherished piece of writing. Um, so that has its own challenges when kind of wanting to honor people's perceptions of and memories of what their experience of reading the book was for the first time and successive times passing it on to grandchildren and whatnot. Um, so I definitely was always aware of, in going into this adaptation process, wanting to honor that, wanting to give people some kind of an experience when they came to the theater um, that, that touched on their own personal memories and, and um, things that they loved about the book kind of being brought to life theatrically. Uh, but also I was aware that the, the, the sort of storytelling needs in the theater are different than the storytelling needs in a novel. And the way things need to be structured dramatically to tell a dramatic story like this one on the stage are actually different structurally than they are over the course of several hundred pages of a novel. So um, that was not necessarily surprising to me, but it was a reminder to me when I got into it about um, sort of being trying to sort of serve uh, two, two things at once. At once be faithful to the novel on a certain level and also give myself the freedom to interpret the novel for the stage. And some of the solutions that we, I think, have come up with uh, for how to do that, um, each had their own kind of surprising journey. Because I'm also the, the director of the piece, I was able to have a kind of flexibility with how and what I brought into the room initially to offer to the actors. I didn't come in with a finished script per se. I came in with ideas and sketches and scenes, but I also came in with questions for them. How should we, you know, and asking them, how should we deal with making the image and, and scene where there's a flying centaur, where Mrs. Whatsit turns, you know, transforms into this magical creature. How should we theatricalize that? When you read about it in the book, of course, you can imagine it yourself, but on stage, what will we do? And so, you know, that and many, many, many other questions like that, in particular, the Tesseract, how do we tesser, uh, was a big, big question about theatricalizing that we don't have the resources, or, or nor do we necessarily want the resources of a film interpretation of tessering, which of course you would see in a CGI way or something like that. How do we create time travel and space travel uh, on, on stage at the Bomer Theater? So that was all something that needed physical solutions, not just text-based solutions. And so because of that, um, the actors played an integral part in what you would call the adaptation of this piece. Oh, and in addition to that, you know, the the I was very much not wanting to kind of take easy liberties with with the dialogue in the piece, you know? I think that that she has a very particular voice. She gives a very particular way of speaking to each of the characters in the book, and for good reason, you know? So that's what brings those characters to life in your ear. And so I was very much trying to match her, carry through her voice in a way, even when I was needing to create new dialogic solutions for how to progress a scene. And as the process has gone on, you know, I set myself that task early on of trying to really wrestle with the piece as she, the scenes as she wrote them and only af only when needed make changes. And so I, I think we've struck a good balance with all of that at this point. I feel pretty, pretty confident that people who know the book will find a lot that sparks their memory and association with the book. And those who don't know the book and who've never read it and don't know the story at all, uh, what I'm hearing now is that people in general are able to follow the story and, and find their own way into this story, even though they don't have the backstory of an association with the novel. So that's really what I was trying to do all along. I came to the book, you know, pretty open 
as far as my original, you know, my initial approach, I was trying to sort of just absorb and listen to the book and let it kind of affect me as opposed to trying to bring sort of my immediate sense of what I thought it should be. And that's kind of been my guiding uh, path all along. One of the things that came to me very early on, which I was not expecting, was this sort of phenomenon, phenomenon of when I would tell people, you know, so what are you working on at the festival next year? Well, I'm writing an adaptation of Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. What? They would say, uh, so many people would say, oh, that was my favorite book growing up. Oh, my goodness, I, I have so much love of that book, and it's affected my life so strongly. And people would really be so, uh, so affected and so much wanting to share with me the importance that this book held in their lives. And that struck me so. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting the depth of feeling that people have for this book and, and want to share their memories. So in a way, that was one of my first sort of big, uh, my, for me, the big emotional hit of the book was, was also the people's love of the book, the readers, people who've read the book, their love of the book. And, um, you know, I'm a big reader. I, I love reading. I love, uh, for the same reason I love theater, because it requires acts of imagination on the viewer's part. And I think that's really something that she, in her own way, has woven into the larger thematic of the book, which has to do with acts of imagination, acts of translation, how we, how we perceive what we perceive and how it's unique unto us, um, and how we kind of create our own world in a way by deciding what that world's going to be to us. And so I thought that was interesting in terms of maybe creating a kind of frame for the piece that included in a way the readers of the book, the people who love the book, and what that experience of reading is um, and how deep it is. And, you know, the book references um, great works of literature through the character of Mrs. Who, who's often quoting um, some of the greatest minds uh, of history. And also, you know, there's several biblical quotes from scripture. Um, and so the book is, is quite literary in its content. Um, and so I also thought it might be interesting to give a kind of literary frame uh, that references the, the book itself uh, in the presentation. So I, uh, that's something that you'll come, you'll see what you think of all of it. I think it's, I feel happy with it. I think it's, I think it's a nice layer to the piece. Of course, the story resonates deeper to me than when I originally started the process. I'm so deep in it right now. We're also sort of, you know, we've been living with this piece for two months. Uh, I've been working on this piece for over a year and been exposed to the piece as a child, growing up as a teen, you know, but not having been sort of reconnected to the piece until very recently, a year and a half ago. Um, but then re-entering the piece with, from my adult perspective has, you know, I'm able to read the piece in a totally different way. And I think that's one of the things that's so magical about that book is that it's, it's something that I sort of always aim to do in my work as well, which is that it's no small trick to, to make a piece that appeals to people at different stages of their lives. Children, young adults, adults, older folks, and, you know, the, the, t the times that we read books, when and what, in what time of our life we come to a book, affects our experience of the book. And with this book, I think that's particularly so. And I think she manages to create something that's very engaging for young people and older folks alike, and for the similar and different reasons. So she manages all this kind of interesting, different aspects of content in these very particular ways. And there's even a great quote from her where she says something like, and I'm paraphrasing, but she says, if the book you're trying to write is too difficult for adults, then write it for children. And I think that's so pithy because um, I think that just speaks to her respect for the, the mind and heart and worldview of children and how truly sophisticated it can be. 
and truly deep it can be in ways that we sometimes, as we grow up, we forget or lose touch with some of those aspects. So just kind of reconnecting with all of the magic that's contained in this book in these very particular ways um, re-surprised me. I was able to see it from the, from the perspective of an adult and kind of as a, as a technician working with the material of the book, kind of pick apart and deconstruct what's happening to make this book this kind of alchemical, magical thing that it is. And how can I try to sort of pull it apart and then put it back together in such a way that it has its own magic on stage. So that's been, that's been a surprising process. I hope that audiences, uh, of course, would be um, thrilled and entertained, first and foremost. You know, I think that I've, I, I was very much interested in wanting to present the piece uh, without an intermission, which was, was one of the, which maybe sounds like a big deal or maybe doesn't, I don't know, but, um, you know, here at the festival, usually plays, and of course Shakespeare plays, which are usually longer, are presented with at least one intermission. And, um, but structurally, I felt that the piece wanted to have a kind of velocity to it because, of course, it is a traveling piece. The, the kids in the piece and the missuses are traveling and careening through, you know, galaxies from planet to planet, from world to world. And I wanted to have that sense almost of a kind of an amusement park ride or a rocket ship ride, something like that. And so I didn't want to break that momentum by taking an intermission. So I wanted the piece to be very compact, very tight, um, you know, in the hour and a half-ish range, where it could be presented as one thing from beginning to end. We start at home on Earth and we return there before we're done. And so that we really take Meg's journey along with her in the way that she would experience it. <laughs>